This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Welcome to Discussions at the Roundtable. I'm your host, Noah Balmer. And today I'm excited to welcome our guest, Ms. Catherine Arnold, to the show. Now, Ms. Arnold is a film industry veteran with a full service consulting and expert witness practice. Her specialties range from economic damages to distribution and more. Uh, she's consulted or been engaged as an expert witness in over 85 cases. Ms. Arnold, thank you so much for joining me here today at the Roundtable. It's my pleasure, Noah. Thank you for having me. Of course. Let's jump into it. Uh, you have over 20 years of experience in film production. How did you get involved in expert witnessing? Well, in the beginning, I actually thought it was a fluke. I <laughs> uh, was still working uh, as a consultant for a production company doing international sales and finance. And I received a an email actually from the Roundtable Group asking for help with the case that was very much in my wheelhouse. And I was, to be honest, a bit surprised. I knew that doctors and, you know, real estate people and, and uh, financial people were experts, but they didn't realize someone with my area would be of service. Uh, so I actually was excited. I, I knew of the industry, so it wasn't a total surprise. And um you know, I, I got the first job. The lawyer wanted to meet me in person because I had never testified before. Sure. And I got the first gig. And it was very simple. It never went to trial. Uh, but they were very satisfied. And they referred me to another case. And those lawyers referred me to another case. And then Roundtable came back to me with a case that uh, the attorneys were Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. Um, as you probably know, one of the largest law firms in the United States. And it was a it was a $90 million case, and their clients flew down to meet me. It was a series of hospitals and doctors. And I realized that it wasn't a fluke, that it was actually uh, something that maybe I could be of service to. And so I did some reading, got some books on expert witness, and found that it was an entire industry of forensic experts. And I kind of took it from there. How long ago was this when you when you first got started? I think uh, I think I got the first case. I want to say sometime around 2000, 2008, but it got more serious. I think that case, and the, and then I was involved with three sets of attorneys on that case. Uh, I think it was around two thousand ten, and I remember that because a, a very close friend of mine said, "Well, we better get you a website," and <laughs> uh, he set me up with a great website. And then I started doing research, and I, uh, you know. When I realized that it was really a business, I said, well, how am I going to get a name for myself? How are people going to start understanding that I exist, that I'm there? I got very lucky and got the entertainment expert as a website. Uh, so that was good. And then I started writing articles based on my experience of film finance, film production, the myths and misnomers of the entertainment business. Uh, and I just kept on writing those articles and both, uh, uh, other attorneys started, I, start, I, I not only subscribed to Roundtable Group, but uh, other listing services and other cases came in. And I think that uh, what really kind of put me on the map more or less was uh, back in 2010 or 11, there was the big Sony hack. Sure. I don't know if you remember. Um, it was, a, a, what was the name of the movie? I'm totally blanking, but it was a, a Sony got hacked and the release of the movie was delayed. Uh, and um, I was asked by, uh, I think it was 15 different news outlets in a 24 to 48 hour news cycle to uh, be a consultant on everybody from Bloomberg to MSNBC to The Hill. And I think having that media and able to put that up on the website was super helpful. So it kind of started there and then the work has flowed consistently you know, ever since then. When you said that having a nice website was, you know, one of your first things that you did, uh, have you found that that website has driven a significant amount of business to you? Because in my mind, in this day and age, people are tending to use social media, things like that a little bit more than, than uh, the tried and true website. So tell me a little bit about your experience with the website. Well, with lawyers and legal issues, you know, you really want to stay away from much on social media, which is, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and that ilk. I have sure. those accounts for another business that I have. But for social media, with respect to legal, I, I have LinkedIn, of course, which is a very solid and reliable resource. But 
having a website with the name, the entertainment expert gives me certainly SEO recognition. And I think that a website also allows you to put up articles. And if you've done media interviews or you can cross link with other websites, I think that has been super helpful. And of course, working with Roundtable Group and other uh, agencies and listing services that have uh, very well known and respected websites is very helpful because lawyers don't know where to turn. You know, the paralegal is usually the one tasked with finding the expert. The lawyers will probably ask their colleagues and their friends, but the paralegal is, or the junior lawyer is the one who's actually tasked with finding them. And of course, they're going to go to the search engines and the agencies, but also they're going to do entertainment expert and click enter. And so having that website with articles and with information and with case listings uh, and the media stuff, it's been absolutely essential for me. Hmm. But again, I think having the entertainment expert and having done so many media interviews and written a lot of articles has certainly been helpful. So a good URL is is definitely uh, crucial, and they're becoming more and more rare in in uh, twenty twenty four. Uh, I don't I yeah. don't know if you had been so lucky to get the entertainment. What is it? The entertainment expert uh, these days. You know, it's it it. I, I got like I said. I, I think I got it in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and I've kept sure. it ever since. I think I have entertainment expert dot net and dot something else, but the only one that I really use is is dot com. Sure. But the listing service is extremely helpful. As is Roundtable Group. Uh, I, I've gotten some fantastic cases and you know not to toot your horn but they're a great organization and very helpful uh you you mentioned that you've published a few times tell me a a little bit about that how did you get started in uh writing as an expert in your industry and uh you know is that something that you recommend other experts do to become more recognized does that help drive uh business i think anytime that you are searchable for any topic is important. And I also think that when a lawyer uh, and or someone searching for the expert can go onto your your website and read articles that you have written, because that will obviously uh, give them an understanding of how you write and expert reports are a a huge part of what we do. And so it was just instinctual, really. No one, I didn't have a guidebook to follow. And yes, I did read some books on marketing for expert witnesses, but it became very clear. So I just wrote articles. I kept them at, you know, what a couple pages at, at most. And then I just put them out on LinkedIn and I put them up on the listing services and I tweeted them out. Well, tweet now it's X. I don't even know what you say anymore. Uh, <laughs> I, I put them out and I think it just, you know, the more that your name is out there, the more that the search engines can find your name associated with your topic of expertise is obviously helpful. But I think it also really helps that the lawyer can uh, can then see your understanding of the subject matter as well as your ability to articulate that because it's one thing, well, I, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent, but I think this will be helpful. There's a couple things that a lawyer will work will look at. One is, do you have a solid understanding and an anchor for whatever your thesis is for your expert testimony? Two, are you able to articulate it in a way that a layperson can understand it? And three, when it comes to uh, testifying in court with a jury, you want to be able to speak in a manner that is understandable for someone who has no idea about what you're talking about and not be so dry and boring that they fall asleep. As a film industry veteran, I'm sure that you have a little bit of a leg up as an expert witness in communicating. Is that right? Has uh, your experience helped well, you? Well, sure. I mean, I I have a background in in creative writing, but this this type of writing is very different. But I do really enjoy the process of educating people. And as an expert, your job is not to be the know it all. It's not to be the person that people are afraid of. Oh, he or she just knows everything and and you cannot be disqualified or you cannot be argued with. It's really your your sole job is to first educate your attorneys if it's an area they're not familiar with. And in my, my field, most attorneys aren't. Uh, but secondly, your, your sole job is to educate the jury and and have them understand what your client and the opposing client is is dealing with. And coming off as a know-it-all doesn't serve anybody very well. And so I learned early on that 
speaking to the jury with a sense of respect. And also, I am just trying to share with you my knowledge. I'm not trying to say that I'm on any different level than you. I think it's really important. I Look, I get to talk about more fun stuff than, say, accounting practices. Um, but I think that's something that a lot of experts would, especially coming up, would be um, really do them a service if they understood that that's their job and not to come across as, well, I know everything. And so you can't you know, argue with me because that's not the case. These days, a lot of cases have been moving towards settlement. Has that affected your job at all? Does What's, what's the difference between an engagement that goes to settlement and an engagement that leads to a jury trial? It, it, there really isn't any difference in the early stages. Uh, you, you know, you can be hired as a consultant, which is pre-trial, and then once they designate you as the expert, that's a different designation. But your job is still the same. Hmm. So your first, your first goal is to um, tell the attorney whether you believe in their case. If you do not believe in the case, do not take it because you will get nailed in deposition. But that's another, that's a whole another conversation. Uh, let me get back to the point, but. First of all, you you just want to educate the attorney and then you write the report and that's when you're designated. But the, the work is the same. You review the material, you assess whether your opinion is appropriate for the uh, plaintiff or defense, depending on who you're working with. And the only difference, oftentimes I've gone fully like I've been, I've re- I sometimes my name alone has settled the case because hmm. I have a, I have a lot of cases behind me. So that's fair, right? But then sometimes just doing the research and giving the attorney the right ammunition so that when they go back to the conferences, it'll settle. Then you can write the report and the report is hard to refute. So that's when you settle or uh, everybody gets tired. But the work is still the same. Once it goes to trial, I've had cases settle the night before trial on major cases. I've been ready to fly to Atlanta and I get a call at 11 o'clock, we settled. So you never know when it's going to settle. The work is the same, uh, but your preparation and then your actual job is more verbal um, rather than written. And it's on record um, rather than being just discussions with the attorney. What are the sort of business considerations inherent in an engagement that may or may not move to settlement? So is it difficult if you don't have some idea of how many hours the uh, the case is going to be because, you know, oh, it might be some huge thing that goes on for months or it might get settled tomorrow? Or how do you prepare for the business eventualities of uh, such a dynamic sort of job? Sure, that's a great question. And so, like I said, you know, here's a good learning lesson. I was and I'd already done about 15 or 20 cases and I was uh, speaking with an attorney and I gave my perspective on the case. And he said, okay, we're going to go and designate you. And I said, great. And I didn't have a fee schedule yet. I didn't have any kind of contract. And he said, okay, we're designated tomorrow and, you know, we'll move forward. And I said, great. And two or three weeks later, I hadn't heard from him and I kept calling and calling. And then I finally got to someone and said, oh, well, the case settled. And I said, okay. And I realized that, as I said, they use my name as a credible expert and the case then settled because the other side. So immediately I realized that the appropriate deal agreement or you know what we call a fee schedule was necessary. And so I uh, worked with, I can't remember where I got the platform. I think I had been involved in some expert organizations and someone gave me a blueprint for a fee schedule they had, but I made sure that prior to designation and or prior to allowing anybody to know I was on the case, the fee schedule and a 10 hour retainer had to be signed and sent to me before they were allowed to use my name. And ever since I've done that, that has never happened to me again. And they even ask, is it non-refundable? And in my case, it is for that very reason, because you're not only getting paid a solid rate for the work that you do, but you're paid for the years that you put into your trade to earn you the right to call yourself an expert. And so by virtue of the fact that I have 20 years, they're not paying just for the 10 hours, 20 hours, 100 hours of work that I do. They're paying for the right to have me back them up. And so therefore, for me, it's 10 hour retainer, just like a lawyer does. You know, sure. it's a 10 hour retainer. And look, in certain instances, I've given half of it back or I've, I've made arrangements if there was a, you know, a, a legitimate reason. But otherwise, the fee schedule, the retainer 
and having that sign before they designate you is critical. That's great advice. Uh, let's back up and talk a little bit about those phone calls. Uh, not necessarily when you were very first, you know, became an expert witness and you had the very first phone call ever, but what are the sorts of things that you should be talking to with a potential uh, with a potential engaging attorney? What are the important things to make sure that you go over to ensure that you are the right person for the job? One of the things that you mentioned earlier that stuck with me is that you have to believe in the case. What else? Well, that is super critical because when you're in deposition and when you're in court, the opposing counsel's one goal is to discredit you um, both as an expert and as a human being. I've had both um, attempts done. I've had both done to me. Um, so when you're taking on the case, it's very important to understand the case itself, your position on the case, and whether your position that you can back up at every twist and turn is supporting their uh, their position. So for instance, I've had lawyers come to me and talk and I say, well, here's the deal. Your, your defendant is right or your plaintiff your opposing counsel is right and this is why and then he said well don't you think this and what about that i said unfortunately no what they this these are the people that are responsible and this is where it went awry and this is how i would testify and i said if you I, rather than taking the case i said if you would like me to prep you on how to be prepared for the opposing counsel because if i was on the other side this is what i would say to you i'm happy to do that so it's really really important to be 100 percent sure of your position and do not get too enthusiastic either about the facts or your position or get too uh, extraneous. You want to stay within the confines of what the conversation is. So to answer your question specifically, you really want to make sure that you understand the, uh, the client's perspective, what they're going for, and if you 100% believe you can support it. And if not, you can say, look, I'll do this and this, but I can't go there. Or I, this is in my wheelhouse, but I need to bring in a co-expert on this because you will get hit hard in deposition, even more than trial, if you are off base and cannot support your position. And it's a, it's a very, it would be, it would be an uncomfortable position if you got disqualified because you didn't have the goods to, to serve up to your client. That's interesting. You mentioned bringing in uh, other experts. Have you been on many cases where you're part of kind of a trial team where there's multiple experts? And if so, to what extent do you interact with them or collaborate with them? Sure. Well, there's, there's two, there are two prongs to that answer. One is, have I been on a team of experts? Yes. There, if you're on a medical case, there are doctors, there are neuroscientists, there are vocational experts, there are, you know, accountants, there are economists. And we, and oftentimes in, in the case of my industry, they're all waiting for me to say what standards and practices are true so then they can go out and base, for example, an accountant or an economist will wait to see what my perspective is and then they'll do all the math to correspond it. A vocational expert will wait for me to say what is and isn't required for a specific job and then they will go and do their research. So yes, I've worked on many, many teams and it's a very collegial um easy conversation. There's there's no animosity. That's super easy. So that's one instance. In a case where I have the experience and or partial knowledge of a case, but let's say it's in the music industry, or let's say it's in, you know, public speaking uh, arena, I have brought in co-experts where I'm more in the background and support the, the expert. They might be the testifying expert, but I have other information and or years of experience as being an expert that can support them. So I've done several cases um, with two or three other people that I, and we've worked really well together. Do you have kind of a team of people that you like to work with that you uh, bring in when those sorts of needs arise? Sure. And so I have someone in the music industry. I have someone in public speaking. I have someone in library evaluation. So there's two or three people. And of course, I have economists that I really enjoy working with. And the economist team that I like, we refer to each other many times because we have a, a strong respect as well as an easy working relationship. So it's it's we've probably been on five or six cases together. 
should experts be hanging out and collaborating outside of cases to kind of form these sorts of teams and network and make these relationships? Is that a, uh, a an avenue for getting more work? There are, look, there are expert witness associations um, and I have been involved in some of them and done, um, you know, panels for them and so forth. It, it, uh, it didn't serve me as a great networking source because my niche is so very specific um but certainly you know and i've attended legal conferences and legal networking expert um uh, legal networking uh, events and again entertainment is just so unique and i don't get hired by entertainment lawyers i get hired by litigators who don't know much about entertainment only right. a few times have they had any experience in entertainment so it's a medical lawyer, it's a real estate lawyer, it's a business lawyer. I, you know, I've worked for Merrill Lynch and the Oprah Winfrey Network. So it, it, it runs the gamut. It, I just don't fall into that. Oh, well, I can put my name out to a thousand lawyers and I'm going to get job. I, they just don't know when an entertainment case is happening. But yes, sure. especially if you're starting out, I highly recommend several of the, I think the forensic expert witness i think it's called the forensic expert witness association is an excellent resource um they have a lot of classes and panels that are super helpful especially starting out um so they're helpful let's talk a little bit about uh, how the industry has changed you've been doing this for quite a while now um have you noticed any significant changes in any area of expert witnessing from the time when you first got started either in your preparation techniques or maybe something has changed because you're on a zoom call rather than in person logistics uh, finding work anything like that 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 comes to mind I don't think much has changed except for COVID brought in the 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 um, the Zoom and the Teams meeting thing, which was you know we were all quiet for about six months because nothing was happening in the courts. But then as they started realizing that they were going to be very backlogged, um, Zoom came in, and I think that I've been in both Zoom deposition, which is becoming much more common because it's a lot less expensive than flying everybody. Right. Uh, a Zoom dep deposition is fine. Uh, you don't have the advantage of uh, having your lawyer there right next to you so it's a little bit awkward and you have to be very careful what information you have around you but um i i would say that that's the only real difference and then zoom trials i have been in i don't like them i think that you being in the room with the judge if it's a bench trial and or the jury as we mentioned before is critical uh, i've been in the trial in the uk and australia so obviously you know that was easier zoom uh, in the uk um but depositions, I think, are the are are now more often than not, if you're not in the city, uh, the way to go. But then again, I had a whole team of lawyers fly out to me because they didn't want me to go there. So everybody's different. But I think the only real change is 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 the technology for communication. Absolutely. Do you have any stories about cases that have in one way or another informed the way that you go about expert witnessing or an aspect of expert witnessing or even a bad situation where, uh, you know, you, it opened your eyes to some of the uh, pitfalls that can happen in expert witnessing. Sure. <laughs> Many. Um, there's a couple of things. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One from a, you know, just kind of a personal demeanor and how you need to maintain your sense of self-worth inside of a deposition as i mentioned earlier so certain lawyers just go about their business and they understand that they're just trying to get information from you there are other lawyers who's and usually in cases where they don't have as much goods you know their case is weaker they will go for the discredit and disqualifying method and they don't just try to discredit you necessarily on your uh, expert opinion. They actually try to discredit you as a human. So you need to be really aware that it is their game and not yours. And you have to have a very solid shell, almost like a warrior force field around you. And just know that it's not personal. It is their tactic. Because I have been in situations that have been so brutal that I, I was shell-shocked for days afterwards because they go after you so so intensely so I've, I've had that so i think it's really important to understand that it's all a game of war and it's not personal and that you just have your force field on and and be prepared for that you were going to ask yes do you, do you feel that attorneys do enough to prepare you for those sorts of eventualities especially when you're newer 
Uh, I think, you know, they try to, they try their best to, uh, to make sure that you know your stuff and they ask questions in various ways. They also try to know enough about the background and what you've testified to before and any of your writings that are in the public domain because lawyers will dig. So if you've been on a case and you've had an opinion published or if you've written an article, they will go back and they will take it out of context. So I think lawyers are good about that. I don't think anybody expects someone to go after you personally. And I have had, and I'm not saying that this is always the case, but being a woman, I have been treated differently than, than the men, my male counterparts. And it becomes very clear that that's what the lawyer is doing. And to that point, if I find that the lawyer, now that I've been through it many times, if I find that the lawyer is being disrespectful and or is um, demeaning in any way, I will actually stop the deposition and or stop the arbitration. So I think that as an expert, you have to remember that you have the right to be treated with respect and to have questions that are within the scope of your um, engagement and your opinion. And if they go too far out, you can either say, excuse me, I think it's time to take a restroom break or I need a glass of water or excuse me with all due respect, that was out of line. I'd like to get back to the appropriate questioning. I've even gotten up from an arbitration and walked out of the room. And I said to your honor, I am so sorry, but this is going in the wrong direction and I'm not comfortable with this line of questioning. It has nothing to do with the case. So I'm gonna ask you to discuss with the lawyer what's more appropriate. And I walked out and the judge nailed him. So I, I can't say that my male counterparts have had or not had that experience, but I think that for either a man or a woman, um, some lawyers play fair and some lawyers don't, but it's important to hold your demeanor, not get emotional and just stick with the facts of the case and allow everyone to stay within their lane because otherwise they'll they'll try to rip you apart and, and, and it can get very uncomfortable. Absolutely. Eye-opening and sage advice. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about venue. You've worked for both plaintiffs and defendants. Do you find that there's any significant difference between uh, engagements that are for plaintiffs and defendants? And for that matter, in state versus federal or other types of venues? No, I think the burden of proof, as we know, is on the plaintiff. So you're you really have to have supporting documentation. I think more importantly, it's really about do your expertise support the um, position of the plaintiff or the defense? That's why I said to you earlier, I actually told a, a plaintiff's counsel that, you know, if you want me to prepare you for the defense, I'm happy to do that, but I can't be your expert. Um, so no, I don't think that's, I think it's important to be able to take both cases if you can, but again, as an expert, you're receiving, you're not going out there um, sure. because if you're known as just a plaintiff or just a defense, they're going to bring that up at trial and it makes it look a little strange. So you had asked me, are there other, any interesting stories um, that you have that you learned? And I was on a, a very large class action, a $200 million class action. And I was, it was one of three plaintiffs and I was on the defense for a large, large corporation, huge corporation. And the, uh, the plaintiff was an actor and he had major names on his team. Like made the expert was probably one of the biggest people in the industry. He had major actors and they were all the, the expert was hired like I was um, to form an opinion. But the major names we're talking household names uh, were there to be character witnesses. And, uh, you know, it, at, at first I was a little intimidated going up against not the actors because that didn't matter to me, but the major player on the other side as the expert. And so I really did my uh, due diligence. I really did my homework. Uh, the attorneys prepped me for four days just for my deposition. They grilled me as to, you know, well, if so-and-so says this, who are you to say that? And he's a major player and all that. And, you know, I just relied on my knowledge, but more importantly, my preparation. I was so well prepared and I had done my homework so well that when they went to trial, although my opposing expert was, as I said, one of the biggest names on the business side of the industry, he was discredited as a witness because I had done the homework and he had not. He relied on who he was, mind you, a big name and extremely accomplished and very well respected, but he didn't do the homework. He just kind of spit out a, a three-pager, most of which was 
well, I whom I am, and I am who I am, and this is what I say, whereas my report was 25 pages long. And so they actually um, disqualified him, and the lawyer came back to me and said, I just want to thank you so much because your work and your preparation and your education of our clients over the course of the last year and a half uh, took us to a win in the first time that we've ever represented this, you know, uh, this client in the past. So I think that don't necessarily get intimidated by who's on the other side. Just be really certain of your case and do the preparation work and you will be fine. Is there, when you talk about doing preparation work, are there any specific preparation techniques that you, that you use? Or do you like to just make sure that you're familiar with your report and all of the materials that the attorney has given you? Well, not only that, you have to do your own independent research and your own independent documentation of, you know, if you just use what the attorneys give you, you tend to get into trouble. So you need to do your own independent research. You need to have your own supporting facts. You need to know the case inside and out. And it, it's really about, well, in our industry, there's no science and methodology to the entertainment business. And a lot of experts and accountant and economist or vocational expert, there are scientific methodologies that they have to follow. So I'm again in a different class. Uh, but what I did in that case was I just did my homework and knew this person's career inside and out, backwards and forwards. And then I did a very detailed report as to what that person would have had to achieve to make the claim that he did. And so it's just really knowing your turf and having the documentation and uh, experience to back it up. Excellent. Before we wrap up, do you have any other last advice for expert witnesses and in particular newer expert witnesses? Don't overstate your experience. Don't overstep your bounds. There's a saying, don't get over the tips of your skis. Because if you try to say things that you kind of know about, but they're a little outside of your wheelhouse, you're going to get nailed for it. So it's better to under promise and over deliver because your report will be parsed word for word by a series of paralegals and attorneys that their only job is to find fault with your report and find fault with your testimony. So number one, don't get out in front of yourself. And number two, be super solid. And, and number three, just be you know calm. Stay calm. Don't get emotional. Follow the the lawyer's lead on how he or she wants you to prepare and 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 handle yourself in the deposition. But I think more importantly, under promise and over deliver. I think that's what the best case is. Sage advice, Ms. Arnold. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you, Noah, and I look forward to hearing the podcast in its completion. Of course, and thank you to our listeners for joining us for another discussion at the roundtable. Cheers. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps. 